Well, good morning. I appreciate the, the fact that you guys are here. Um, we want to lay out to the public uh, where the Senate is at, uh, um, that this is not a game, uh, that uh, we're in a serious spot, and we want you all to be aware of that exactly. So we're laying our cards down on the table, or at least as many as we can. Uh, but what I want to say, first of all, is where were we last year at this time? The election was over. We were a, an exuberant bunch. Republicans took the majority. And we told you what we were going to do. We said that we were going to provide some significant tax relief uh, for farmers, small business owners, seniors, et cetera. And we did that. We said that we were going to do a transportation bill uh, for, focused on roads and bridges, and we did that. We said we we're going to stop the collapse of health care and give premium relief uh, for those that were in crisis, and we did that. And that was done with the governor in the House, and, and it felt like there was real momentum. Uh, there was more than that. There was, I believe it was called the FAST Act, where the governor called us up and said there's 100, roughly $100 million on the table for transportation if we can get it done now. And we did it. And that was the momentum that I think all of Minnesota appreciated. And uh, I hope we can get back to that. Uh, but today I want to lay out where the Senate is. Uh, as you're aware, or if you're not aware, the Senate and the House are uh, on two different levels in that we run out of money about two months before the House. And so we're the ones that have to first uh, encounter some difficulties. And so as we talk about where we're at, if we do nothing, on, on December 1st, we are out of money. On December 1st. Uh, which means there's no building payment, which means staff don't get paid, which means senators don't get paid, which means health insurance isn't provided. And so we're in a very, very difficult spot there. Uh, we have the opportunity to work with the House and to uh, see if we can call a legislative coordinating commission meeting, uh, which is deter determined by the chair, which is the Speaker of the House at this point. Uh, but it's not everything that the governor laid out. Uh, the governor said, well, they've got all kinds of money. I believe he used the number $40 million. Uh, Most of that money in the Legislative Coordinating Commission is encumbered. It's already used for things. So we can't just raid that money. I think that would be irresponsible. Uh, but we have found that, that there is carryover money there, uh, a few million, a little over $3 million. And we can, we think, reach out and use that. But we don't know that yet. Um, and and I, I realize that it's Republicans that control the House and the Senate. But the fact is, we have to actually have a meeting, and we have to talk about what is that money going to be used for. And the House has as much of a voice in this as we do. And so that's why I'm asking uh, the Speaker uh, that we would hold a Legislative Coordinating Commission meeting and and walk down that path as far as what we can use. Uh, but two things that are involved that I think people should be aware of about the Legislative Coordinating Commission, uh, one of them uh, is funding for the legislative auditor. And the legislative auditor, uh, Jim Nobles, uh, plays a very important role, and, and he put out uh, a, uh, a letter about some of the things that he thought were very important uh, that we should not be meddling with or should not be taking money from him. The other one is the revisor's office. The revisor's office uh, is, works all year round, and they help uh, with rulemaking with all the agencies. And so that's another one that we should not be taking money from. I think, I think it's irresponsible, uh, but if we're backed into a corner, I don't know what the best course is at that point. Um, so, but those are two of the things that we have to work through. Uh, oh, and, but if we do nothing, December 1 is the end. So why did we not send out furlough notices yet? I asked our Secretary of the Senate, Cal Ludeman, uh, to hold off. But we have communicated to our staff, and I have communicated with Senator Bach, the minority leader, and they've communicated with their staff, that we're trying to find some other way through. That's the goal. But everybody on the Senate side, for sure, is, is aware that if we do nothing, and if we can't have an LCC meeting, then it's December 1. Uh, my hope is that, though, we will be able to use those dollars or some of those dollars, and that will move us to somewhere in January. We put January 12th down as the date. That's if we continue functioning uh, mostly as is. 
uh, that's the date. And so furlough notices would go out. It would be January 12th. Uh, that's when everything ceases. We, uh, our phones are get forwarded. We lock the, the Senate doors. Uh, things close down. Bonds and says uh, he upholds the ruling that he originally had because the Supreme Court did not vacate that ruling, uh, or we hope the Supreme Court rules because we are at the place that furlough notices will go out. Uh, if, if, we, if we are able to move it to mid-January, then furlough notices will go out December 1st. That will be when we send out the notices because we want ample time for everyone to know that this is the real deal. This is not a game. So that's basically where we're at. Uh, some of it is still a little murky in that uh, you know, we don't know what the courts are going to do. Uh, if the, if the uh, Judge Guthman responds and the court does nothing, that, that uh, the money that we're using now is not carryover, but it's actually our, our money that we have in our budget, that's another thing that, that changes the dynamics of what we're doing. The governor is saying right now that we're using carryover money. We are appealing to Judge Guthman that it's not carryover money, that it's actually the money that we normally always use. And so that's, that's why I say there's so many moving parts here, but we're trying to lay out to you what, what's going on and the seriousness of what's happening. So I think the other thing that I, I uh, want to bring up is, so we're appealing to the courts, but I'm, I'm also appealing to the governor, uh, that uh, there's been enough pain, there's been enough blame, that it would be best for Minnesota if we got back to the momentum that we had in the beginning. And there was a lot of conversation, there was a lot of um, give and take. Uh, he gave his word and kept it, I gave my word and kept it. And that was really what was really good for Minnesota. So I'm appealing to the governor to either uh, remove his appeal to the, to the Supreme Court or to call us back into special session to let us fund the legislative uh, bodies. So with that, I'll take uh, any questions that you might have. I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Is the absence of uh, the speaker here right now an indication that you're having trouble or not getting cooperation on getting that meeting scheduled with the LCC? Uh, no. Uh, what I will tell you is the House and Senate, no matter who's in charge, are different. And so we, we don't completely agree on where we should be going, but, but we both know that we're in trouble if we don't have funding or if the courts don't decide or the governor doesn't uh, call us back. But uh, because they're two months later uh, than, than we are, I just felt like you need to know that the Senate is, it's happening right now. And so... That would be the clearest answer I can give you there. Senator, the governor uh, says repeatedly that you could resolve this if you meet with him, if you get back together and renegotiate what you had earlier in the year. Why not do that if you are so concerned about furloughs and suspending operations? Uh, partly because if, if uh, this governor can do this, why not him veto the House and Senate, then all future governors will be able to do this. And, and I'm interested in protecting the power of the legislative body. I think you'd find that Senator Bach is on the same page with me. And so when you see that the Democrats and the Republicans are united in the legislative branch, this is not the way it's ever been done before. And if we allow this now, then this is the trend for the future. So that's number one. Number two is we agreed in negotiations to many things that we did not want to do that the governor got. We spent more money than we felt that we should spend, but that was a passion for him. The five items that he now wants us to renegotiate, it would, it, it would be, doesn't make sense for us to do that. And so that would be number two. I still think there's other things that we could find that we both think need to get done that could be a win for both sides. But for me, the biggest thing is protecting the legislative branch and the, the, I think it's the voice of the people and if we change the dynamics, that's what it will be forever forward. Secretary Newman's memo says that under present circumstances, furlough notices will go out tomorrow. Yes. Are, are they going out tomorrow? No, uh, because I'm, I'm asking, 
I, I've had conversations with the speaker. Uh, we, we know for sure at this point they are open to uh, joining us in an LCC meeting, but they set the date. Uh, exactly how much uh, money we all agree to is not agreed to yet. That's the part we have to work through. Um, you know, but it's not big dollars. How much money meaning how much money from the LCC's yes. carry forward? You yeah, can... there's a little over $3 million of carryover. We feel like that is, is a, a resource that it doesn't affect anybody in a significant way. The only potential is if something suddenly comes up, which is why you have some carryover, then that, that creates a situation that I, I don't see at this point. Will the LCC ask be Senate specific or would that include some transfer to the House as well? Uh, it could be either way. My, my hope is that the Senate gets it all uh, because uh, at this point the House is two months ahead of us or have two, month, two months of money that we don't have. Um, that buys us more time to figure out if the courts are going to make a decision or, or the governor. Um, you know, it doesn't get us to February 20th, uh, but if we can get through the Christmas season, uh, I think that would be helpful. And I'm, st I'm still, I'm an optimist, the glass is one-fourth full, that we can actually find a way through it, uh, but it will take all three of us finding a way. Senator, what have you done uh, up to now to cut costs in the Senate. Would you uh, go through some of those? Well, is that a softball pitch? Well, I'll give you a hardball if you want. <laughs> I'll give you the high heat. <laughs> well, you got a lot of it, too. I've noticed over the years, which I love. Uh, now you did my glasses because this is a little smaller. But uh, right away, uh, we, we stopped out-of-state travel reimbursement. Uh, uh, but two things that we're doing effective today is we're doing no per diem and uh, no mileage back and forth, uh, particularly for rural members. If you're uh, Mark Johnson, you know, up in the northwest corner of the state, uh, that mileage is a big expense for somebody like him. So those are more things that we're doing now. Um, I will tell you up front, if, uh, we're going to continue to pay our rent. Uh, most uh, senators that are rural, does, or uh, House members as well, uh, over the years we've uh, provided rent uh, rather than paying a hotel room every time you're down, it's more cost effective to the state and it brings some stability to them. The farther away you are, uh, the more important it is to have some sense of stability. Uh, we don't, we allow up to $1,800 in the Senate. I don't know what the House allows for rent. Uh, you don't get uh, something, you don't get a, a high end um, apartment with that kind of money. Well, are you stopping per diem? Are you stopping out-of-state travel? Are you stopping all of that? Yes. And why not stop the pay for the legislators now instead of yeah. warning that you're going to lay people off? Uh, well, I've, I've told our staff and senators, Republican and Democrat, that we're all in it together. And we want to, we're hoping that we have some solutions. To, if we stop pay, if we stop Health care. We have two of our staff, for sure, that I know of that are on maternity. Are we just going to stop their benefits? I don't want to. I'm trying to find a way to, to go as far as we can uh, looking for a solution along the way. And that's why, you know, people have house payments. You know, some senators uh, uh, have the ability to, you know, this is their uh, one of many things they do or one of a, a number, a couple things they do. The courts have said that you know if there if we get to that place where our functions stop that it's unconstitutional. So we're trying to figure out, you know, what is the best way to show them that we are truly in a difficult spot. What happens February twentieth if there's no staff and no one's getting paid? Making history. This has never happened before, you know, so I don't, I wish it wasn't happening to us, uh, but we've been given this task and I'm going to do my best to figure out a way through it. Would you uh, just adjourn uh, the first day or well, the first thing how we're could you do live along? Whenever we're back, if we don't have an agreement, is, is to pass a budget for the House and Senate. We have to do that. 
Um, I, I, I hope the governor is open. I believe he is open to that, but my hope is that we do that sooner. He could call us back into session now, or he could, you know, you know I, don't, I, I don't know if he would take or, or remove his uh, appeal to the, the, the uh, Supreme Court. I don't know if he'll do that or not, but we can do a special session as well. Uh, we've, already cut, we've already been through mediation, so we know uh, where we aren't going to have success. But there are plenty of other things we could look at for success for both sides. I have heard that several times that a factor that might be chosen is to congregate on the day of the session beginning and then sign off, sign the die, and leave the governor effectively rendered without an office. Is that yeah. a tactic that might be exercised? Do you foresee that possibly happening? I don't, I don't want to play games with this. You know, my goal is to, to find a way for the legislative branch to function again the way it's supposed to function to then build momentum with the governor to do the kinds of things that we did like we did throughout most of last session. That's my goal. So if we just sign a die, we're still in the same predicament uh, and real, real people's lives are affected and, and constituents aren't going to get uh, the help that they need. And, and none of that to me is, is a good reason to do that direction. When did you talk to the governor last? Uh, Within the last few weeks, I did call him in the last couple days. I believe he's out in, on a trip. And uh, so I, I did circle back to some people around him uh, to communicate what we're trying to do. So. Any positive signs in any back channeling? Anything? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I would say, you know, I think we all want to figure out a way to, to find a way through. You know, I really do. It's not hard to anticipate the, the response to this, from possibly from the governor's office, is that this is political posturing, that you're, you're warning about furloughs right before Christmas, that this is all just a political game. How's your, what do you respond? I don't think the governor uh, thinks that about what I say. Uh, I, I really don't. So. What's been the practical impact, other than legislators maybe having to shoulder more of a burden if they want to be taking trips and things, but on constituents, are you seeing you know meetings people can't get to, situations? Well, up until now, we've, we've held a number of committee meetings. I believe it's something like 70 over the uh, interim. That is in our brief to the courts. I just don't know the exact number. Uh, so we won't be doing any of that. Uh, I, like I mentioned, I think we have 14 staff were down in the, in the Senate. Uh, so we're not able to respond as well. It becomes more critical, obviously, when you get into session, but it's made planning for next session extremely difficult. This is, you know, taking a lot of our time when we really want to focus on, you know, we have major issues that we're going to have to address, likely address next year. One is we don't know what the federal government's going to do related to health care, but that will definitely affect us. If they end up passing a tax bill, that is a significant shift that we have to address. And so, those are the things we need more time to plan now, and we're not going to pay mileage, we're not going to pay uh, the per diem. Those are costs that we're asking these senators uh, to pay. Salary is not huge. I mean, even with the pay raises, it's not, it's not a large salary that people have. You know, and then the, you know, the real dynamics of... To lay our cards on the table and say this is the next step if we can't uh, find a way through. Bonding bill hopes kind of dashed, being that the Senate never got to travel and see the projects while the House does. I mean, could that shrink the size of the bill, make the will and interest less in your chamber? Well, it certainly makes the interest less in, in a bonding bill. Um, you know, I want to try to keep an open mind. If we get through this, what should we be doing anyway? Uh, so I'm going to continue to try to do that. It hurts when we're not seeing the projects. I, Senator Senjum has been around the block a long time, so it's not like he doesn't know many of the projects. But that's part of the process that a, a legislator needs to actually see something. You know, for that legislator, is this pork or is this something important? What are the priorities? How soon do we need to do it? All of those, we, we diminish our ability. But... Um, I, I still have to say, if we can figure out a way through, then, and this is important to different players, then I, I want to be open to at least consider it. Senator, maybe you said this, but how many people are we talking about that would be furloughed, and what kind of roles do they play? What, give us an idea of what some of these people do here at the Capitol. 
we know the exact number? I believe it's uh, House, Senate, and nonpartisan staff, if we include LCC, depending on how that all plays out, is a little over 500. Uh, if we're just talking about uh, House and Senate, Democrat and Republican, it's uh, less than that. Um, so if you're talking about a legislative assistant, anytime somebody makes a call into the Capitol, they're the first person that answers the call and often can give an answer to a person. If it's an issue that rises up that's uh, new or, or important or uh, a number of people start complaining, like Minlars, for example, it, it underlines that here's a problem that we need to address, and sometimes it's we need to address it now or as soon as possible. So that's why I use Minlars, because I've gotten so many emails and calls on that that it's just it's almost like Mincher over again. And so, and so we actually, that is the one committee meeting that we're still, uh, is still on the agenda to happen uh, coming up this week because it, it can't wait. But they're not going to get per diem and they're not going to get uh, mileage, so please come, but you know, we're going to try to navigate through that. So that, that's kind of how information comes through. And then all of our research people and all of our committee administrators, uh, particularly on the majority side, but also the minority side, are researching bills and <coughs> what should be we be working on for next year. And so they're gonna look at what are other states doing and how do we address it. And, and so we begin to prepare the bill so that when we get into session, the bills are already, there are already many written that are issues that we have to deal with now. There's already been conversations with all the, the interested groups, both sides of an issue, so that we can actually do a bill that makes sense or if something in the bill is uh, too far one way or the other, then we've already know because we've been working on it. Especially when we start February 20th, we only have a three months to figure out and pass bills. So it's already be, gonna be very condensed. And so all of that time ahead of time is what you need for good legislation. Senator, getting back to Tom's question, you mentioned about 500 maybe between the House and the Senate. How many specifically in the Senate could be furloughed December 1st? Well, you have your 67 senators, the staff uh, for, uh, for uh, Trying to add the Democrat number. I, I, anybody got a number for me? 205. Thank you. It's 205. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 So, you know, and I think the governor con is concerned about them as well. Uh, I actually think the governor didn't defund uh, the LCC because those are all nonpartisan staff with functions that they uh, need to do for the whole state. And so that's. My guess is that's why he did not defund them. You said you were in agreement with Senator Bach. Why isn't he here if you two are literally in agreement on this? Well, because this is a Republican majority leader press conference. Uh, no, I mean, we, we've talked about it a lot. I've talked to, the, to uh, Senator Bach a, a number of times about this uh, uh, to make sure that it's a legislative issue and not a, a partisan issue. Uh, and I told him from day one, we will not furlough Democratic senators or staff any earlier than we would Republican. And so I think he, he knows that I'm trying to approach this as, as the, the number one reason is the legislative branch needs to keep the power we have. And so I, I believe uh, if we, I believe he'll come to the legislative coordinating committee, uh, LCC meetings when we have them, uh, that should say that there's some unity. The work of the legislative commissions that are working now, the House has enacted pretty much the same measures you're enacting to, as of today. Will there be any reason for that work to curtail between now and the. And which January? work? Well, you're talking about the Data Practice Commission, which is talking about meeting in January so that it can make recommendations on legislation, et cetera. So I still think those meetings are, some of them are really important, uh, which is why I'm trying to figure out how do, we, how do we get to a place where the courts decide, make a decision, or the governor helps us find a way through this. Uh, because I don't want those not to happen, but if, if we're into January and we still are at, a, at an impasse, then we can't. We have to, you know, everything has to be uh, squeezed out and down. And so, and that but the, on yeah, legislation. yes, but that doesn't mean I don't think we shouldn't be paying attention to these things. All right. Thank you, appreciate it.